Hi everyone and welcome back to season 8 of Stand Up and Stand Out. I'm your hostess with the mostest, Nikki Green. Throughout the past 8 seasons, we have worked to showcase some incredible guests with eclectic backgrounds so you can see that success comes in many shapes and sizes. On our path to episode 100, we have some new inspiring interviews to celebrate this important milestone of our podcast. As I add retreats into my coaching program, I'm looking forward to meeting more of you in person and connecting with you beyond the podcast. I hope you enjoy season eight and I look forward to hearing your feedback and comments on the fascinating topics we will cover with each new guest. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Stand Up and Stand Out. I'm so excited for episode 100. Of course, if it's this, you know, celebration milestone episode, we would be remiss if we didn't go back through the previous episodes and showcase some of the highlights. But before we do that, I just want to maybe reflect a little bit on the lessons I've learned about the podcast. Some of these I've hit on in previous episodes, but, um, you know, one of the most often questions I get is, you know, how did you start your podcast and how do you keep it going this long? And so I think I've got kind of a top five lessons learned through the podcast that I think are going to be important for anybody as a guest or as a host um, that they might want to know. So first of all, it is don't do it all yourself. I learned that the hard way in the first five episodes. And as I was preparing for this show and going back through those old episodes, oh my goodness, looking at, uh, first of all, I didn't have this cool background. <laughs> it was getting stuck in it. I couldn't seem to figure out where the camera was and the sound was not that great. So one of the things I really want to celebrate as we hit this milestone is my amazing podcast manager, Felipe, who has been behind the scenes pretty much since that early stage. Uh, making the show better. And I was so proud to um, be able to get him featured in Podcast Magazine for all that hard work that he does to make this show great. Everything from telling me how to improve my lighting to make sure I'm wearing headphones to improve the sound, how to improve the mic setup. Um, it's been all him behind the scenes. And I really appreciate his expertise with audio through his music to be able to share that with me um, so I can make the podcast better. Believe it or not, um, one of the things I always hear from people is like, oh, you know, quality is not that important. I just record and then I go pop it out there. And as I've started to listen to other people's podcasts more as I'm on other people's show, I really want to reinforce that podcast quality is important and you should be spending time on post-production. You don't need to spend a ton of time because now there is some improvements with software and a little bit of equipment that you can do so you can make the show better as you're making it. Um, and but I still have my team behind the scenes that um, helps me focus on other quality elements that the software and the equipment can't do. One of the big things is as I'm listening in my car to audiobooks and podcasts, I'm realizing how bad some of the sound quality is. And it's absolutely amazing because it's not that hard to make these improvements. And I've actually just completely turned off shows and books on books on tape, <laughs> but audiobooks. Because I couldn't hear anything as I was driving. You know, I live in Chicago. There's a lot of traffic, always hawking, and who knows what else is going on. And so I think it's really important for us to focus on that audio. Just so that you guys know, one of the other things I do with my podcast that maybe you guys haven't thought of is it has improved my ability to land speaking gigs. I use it as an audition tape or speaker reel. So the better quality you have on the show, um, the better you're going to show up to those potential paying um, event planners. Uh, number two is screen your guests. <laughs> An average podcast host spends 10 hours of research and prep vetting a guest and getting each show ready. And I think a lot of guests underestimate that if they don't have their own podcast. And what I find is most guests that have come to me over the years are doing less than 60 seconds to write some sort of demanding email of have me on your show. A lot of times now, a lot of them are using booking agents who are, again, even more pushy because that's their job. But again, a big shout out to people behind the scenes is I was very fortunate to um, have Amy Downing helping me during my early stages of podcasting to help get me on other shows. And she really showcased to me like what it should look like for us to be able to listen to the show, make sure it's our ideal audience have my materials ready, like my one sheet, and to just be kind. I think that I've heard a lot of horror stories lately from other podcast hosts of really demanding pre-guests. They're not even on the show yet, but they're asking to be paid. 
when they have no brand or following that they're bringing to the table. And there was just so many problems in the early days where, you know, I wasn't really selective. I didn't know what I was doing. And so I was constantly chasing guests for their headshot and their bio and things that I needed in order to promote the show, even just to get the silly editing done. And so not only was that a bit frustrating, because again, it wasted a lot of my time on something I'm not really earning money on, but then I would give them all this stuff I had spent all this time on, and then they didn't promote. Sometimes they hadn't even listened to a single episode of my show, even their own, after they'd been on the show. So be a better guest um, and be very selective with the guests you have on your show. Make sure that they are a good fit for your audience. Um, and now I definitely do pre-meetings with everyone to make sure that they are the right fit. Number three is it's okay not to publish an episode. Um, I've had this discussion with many other hosts. So if you guys don't know this as guests, um, but just because people show up, sometimes they're not showing up in the right way and the right fit for your audience. At the end of the day, this is your product that you're putting out and you want to make sure that you're putting out a quality product that makes sense. And this doesn't necessarily mean like you shouldn't have guests on that maybe have a different point of view. I think sometimes that's really important for you guys to debate. It's about how they're really showing up for you versus themselves. Meeting people ahead of time has really kind of screened this out for a lot of people. But I know, again, in that early stage, um, I didn't really know how to find guests or what I was looking for. So um, I had a little bit of a hodgepodge of things that were going on. I always try to make clear in that first meeting that this is not a transactional relationship. It's to grow my long-term business partnerships and network and bring people into my community. This isn't a one and done for me. And so for me, it was even more important that these guests think of it in the same way. For the few guests that came on that were unprepared, adding nothing of value for my audience, and really only trying to take advantage of my team's hard work. I just said, you know what, this just isn't a good fit and we're not going to put it out. A lot of them um, are, have been really amazing and so and really generous and also doing pod swaps so I can be on their show. So that part I have absolutely loved. But occasionally I do have people that are rude to my team and I've been very clear. I will cancel your episode, even if it's that day. If you are not respecting, you know, my VA helping to schedule and getting us again, your materials in advance of the show, those people behind the scenes, to be honest, they're the real ones in power. <laughs> One thing I definitely learned throughout my journey in corporate is um, the people that schedule, they're really holding the, the calendar, they're holding the guidelines for that person who is so busy, who is um, you know, running around doing all these other things. Podcasting is one element of my business. And like I said, it's not really revenue generating. This is, has all these other purposes behind the scenes. So be a good guest. Um, and if you are a host and you get a bad one, <laughs> don't be afraid to just say, sorry, that one did not make the cut. Number four, another thing I learned um, definitely from having uh, my episode reviewed in Podcast Magazine. So I super appreciate that one, you know, just getting a little bit more word out about the show put an honest review that said they loved the conversation that I had in the, you know, interview ones, which is the majority of my show. But a lot of my solo episodes felt really scripted in the beginning because they were somehow just me here talking to the camera and my cat. <laughs> it just became a little bit too much. And so the more I could just be my natural self and talk to the camera, then it just felt more natural and it was more interesting. So I've tried to do that and just have a little bit of an outline so I don't get too off script. And you end up with a three-hour episode because nobody's that kind of attention span anymore. And number five, and I know you guys have heard this for sure, but repurpose, repurpose, repurpose. Um, and I keep finding new ways to use the material um, and some advice from some of my team as they've been getting more into the episodes and using less time because software optimization, they can do more creative um, aspects. So um, a second shout out to Juan, who does such amazing work on my SEO. He has created all the new shorts for the last few seasons um, and the podcast specific graphics, you know, that YouTube look that I was kind of missing in the early episodes. Um, so I really appreciate that because it makes it so much easier to share onto social media. And social media has made this big shift from kind of static graphics into video. And so being able to have not just one, but a couple of different short clips that I can highlight different pieces of the episode and then drive people um, to the main episodes to see this, the full feature. And the other thing is, this is getting me a lot of traction, which has been great. Um, I think I mentioned on a previous episode or maybe it was somebody else's, 
I got recognized um, at a book event um, as being a YouTube influencer because they had seen my YouTube videos. Um, and funny enough, it wasn't an adult and it wasn't someone looking to, you know, advance their career. It was a little probably nine year old girl. <laughs> And she was telling her mom she wanted to get her picture with me um, because she had seen my YouTube shorts. And then she proceeded to tell me all about her career aspirations. So it was a really cool experience. Um, and I really just am thankful to Juan for making that happen for the show. You know, the obvious one, too, is taking the video and being able to do transcripts so easily now and converting those into blogs or into my newsletter. So people can get like kind of a little snippet and excerpt and then go watch the full episode if they prefer that. One of the things that I have done that I don't think a lot of other people may be doing or haven't really heard it from other coaches is I use my podcast as a bonus for my coaching and online courses. So a lot of times you go through these online courses and you can tell they've been recorded maybe one, two, three years ago while people were stuck inside during the pandemic and they really haven't updated them a lot. So one thing I like to do is as I do an episode with an expert in the field of something that I teach in my course normally, I add that podcast episode link into my online course and into my coaching forum. So that way, if they want to go deeper or they just want to hear kind of another viewpoint on that topic, they can more easily just click on the episode, take it with them, and then, um, you know, go check it out. So I love that as enhancing the learning experience again um, without creating a whole bunch of new stuff. And they get to hear someone other than me give their their advice on the topic. And like I said, um, the best thing has been using my speaker reel. This is a lot of material. And so if people want to see what it's like to see me on stage um, virtually or in person, there's a lot of great excerpts, not only from Stand Up and Stand Out, but also being a guest on other people's podcasts. And if you guys didn't hear that I did this, um, I think it's just another cool feature is as people send me my links for being a guest on someone else's podcast, I've actually made a playlist both on Spotify and YouTube that says Nikki as a podcast guest. So this also gives a way of like, I'm answering questions live. So if people want to see me, you know, maybe have on a panel, they get a feel for what I'm like when I'm getting asked, um, you know, kind of random, random or scripted questions. So think about that if you're a speaker and you're trying to figure out ways to, you know, utilize all of these materials. Um, it was a great way to capture all that stuff together. And not only is it a playlist on Spotify, but they have an embed code that I can then stick on my website. And so again, if people want to see me on other episodes, they can go and that'll be actually live on the website and update every time I add something to the playlist. You guys, I, I always laugh because when I listen to things like on audiobooks or other people's podcasts, I always have to put everything on like one and a half speed because it just gets too slow for me. But I always joke that I think people probably when they're listening to my podcast or maybe even my audiobook, they might have to put it on half the speed in order to stay up with what I'm doing. Oh, it's just how I roll. People always say like, oh, when I was younger, it was one of the funny things as I was learning to speak and, you know, getting used to being on stage. People would say, oh, well, you've got to slow down. You know, you're talking too fast. It must be because you're nervous. I said, no, this is actually just naturally how I talk. So I um, just kind of laugh at that, you know, kind of feedback back then of like, yeah, if I slowed down, I just don't think I'd get as much done in the either. So talking about some of our favorite episodes, I'd love to hear some of yours. I'd love to have you guys drop it in the comments or give me some feedback through social media. What were your favorite episodes and why? I'll tell you for sure. Episode number one with my friend, Dr. Matt James is absolutely my favorite for a lot of reasons. One, you know, it was just kind of special of getting started and getting started with someone who's such a good friend of mine because I had no idea what I was doing and he'd never been on a podcast either. And we had all this time during the pandemic. Um, we decided we'll do a practice run. So we were just kind of casual shorts and tank top over the summer, you know, and we decided to record. And that episode went great, you know, it, and we recorded it, but it was just sort of like, oh, we were bantering and we were going through the material and kind of making notes for our outline. And then we came back like the next day, you know, dressed up and everything kind of in business form. <laughs> and now the episode, it was just a little stilted. It's still great material. And I love the content of the episode, especially for where I was at personally in my life and in the business. But, you know, now I just pick apart all the little things that we've spent so much time improving uh, this beautiful, you know, background that we have 
have here my wonderful um, logo from my family that they've made. Um, so for those that are on the video, they get just a, a much richer experience, um, what they see, and it also improves the sound. My editing was a mess on that first one because I had no idea what I was doing. I love Descript. I've been using it since the very beginning. Uh, we'll drop our affiliate link into the show notes. Um, and Descript itself has gotten so much better, um, so I don't have to be that much better. Um, but you can just see all the stilted kind of editing because I didn't quite know how to fix maybe, you know, smaller pieces rather than the big jumps that I was making. And look really nervous. I, I think I was nervous. Um, and so it's funny to think back that, yeah, that first version was a little bit better. But it was just safe and it was fun to start this adventure with a friend of mine. And no one was watching yet. So there was really no downside and nothing to be afraid of. So thank you again to uh, Dr. Matt James for <laughs> being my guinea pig and helping me get started with this journey. This model is really built on two dynamics that are observable in behavior when it comes to our interactions with anybody, not just bad bosses, but with anybody. One is your level of engagement. The Gallup organization do engagement studies annually, and uh, we're probably familiar with the impact of high engagement versus low engagement and what that means to companies and productivity. But it, the same applies with bosses. Is your boss exhibiting behavior that is high engagement, an assertive boss that's very pushing kind of energy versus a boss who is showing behaviors that are more like disengaged or just has given up or has quit? They still show up every day, but they, they don't bring much of themselves to the party. Right. Yeah. The other access here is around emotional intelligence. Now, you, we could probably do a whole podcast on emotional intelligence. That one alone. Yeah. <laughs> one for, you know, coming up because it's a there's books and books uh, written about this. But at a high level, when it comes to your boss, emotional intelligence really is about: Are you aware of how you come across to other people, and how do you manage your own behavior? It's really easy to tell what kind of bad boss you have because they're so outward and open about it. They're very over on this violent side, big gestures, loud voice, pointing fingers, that kind of emotional intelligence is an easy sign for us to tell which kind of boss we might be dealing with. But their opposites are the people who are more controlled, who mm -hmm. have the poker face every time. You just don't really know where you stand with them because they keep everything so close to the best. So what you come up with is you've got one type that is very openly hostile. Their high engagement, very characterized as assertive, even violent when it comes to, to emotional intelligence. They, they like to create an environment of fear. I call that person the bully. There's another type of bad boss that is uh, high in engagement, but they tend to keep things to themselves a little bit more buttoned up, highly controlled emotionally. I call that the politician. There is another highly controlled person, but this person, in contrast to the politician, has given up. They're disengaged. What's the point? I can't really get anything done here, so I just go along. I call that the nice guy, and I use that term gender neutral. It could also be a nice girl, nice guy type of boss. I think the one that does the most damage in organizations is the one that's hard to talk about. It's the one who is also very hostile, aggressive, emotional. When it comes to that emotional intelligence, they just don't have it. They just tear through the organization and leave a wake of dead bodies. And at the same time, they're really disengaged and disengaged, not from the work, but disengaged from like the mission of the company. If the mission is to, to take care of patients or is to provide great customer service, they are disconnected. Their only mission is their mission. And mm. if you're not on board with that, then you have just incurred the wrath of the evil genius because I think they have a, the most negative impact on people our mental health, performance, and they get away with it. The second favorite episode was definitely a recent one with my friend, Abby. The first time her and I tried to record, the internet went out. Uh, just a whole bunch of things went wrong. There was like a thunderstorm, maybe a tornado. Oh, yeah, there was a tornado warning. So um, her and I had met in a bar while I was um, at a networking event in Dallas. Of course, we had a few drinks, um, but Personality-wise, her and I just really hit it off from the very beginning. And so um, I really appreciate her just being her natural um, self and just kind and sharing and uh, offering to do the podcast swap and being patient through all the technical and weather-related challenges. 
um, her and I have a lot of parallels in life too, kind of going opposite directions. But um, yeah, it was great just learning more about her and just laughing the whole time. Um, such a contrast, you know, from the beginning of the show where I could really just enjoy the time here and not overthink what's going on every episode, but really get to know each of the guests, which I really love doing and to build that network. I got a lot of great feedback from the listeners too. They love that one. They love that personality coming through. And so it just really reminds us again is like over scripting and over planning what we're going to do. If people can tell. And it really doesn't work and unless you have some sort of like storyline podcast, crime podcast that you kind of need to go from A to Z. Um, we're just kind of hanging out and having a good time and hopefully sharing some good lessons in between. I think a lot of people have missed that over the course of years, we've been focusing so much in a more masculine energy dominating world. Now, I'm not saying masculine dominating world, although there are corporations and things and blah, blah, blah. And it doesn't you can have political beliefs and all the things. I don't do that. It's like hogwash. I just don't pay attention. I do my thing. But when we're talking about like a masculine energy, that is the focus of getting things done. What do I have to do? Here is the list. I need to know X, Y, Z, right? Vulnerability and not knowing and trust and compassion and belief and nurture and care is all coming from our feminine, feminine energy. And so when you're sitting there talking about that vulnerability, Everything screaming in me is that the reason why we feel so uncomfortable and we feel exposed and we feel raw and we feel like it's almost wrong when we're in our vulnerability is because we're not used to being in the feminine energy. We're not used to practicing in feminine energy. Feminine energy allows you to be open to receive love. It, we're open to receive joy. Like I just think of, okay, when I'm focusing on feminine, I think you're focusing on receiving energy. What are you open to? What are you, what do you think your self-worth is? If you don't even know what your, if your self-worth value is, you're attracting what your value is. So if you don't think very much of yourself, then you're going to attract that same level of your self-worth value. Thinking about kind of now the top rated or top listened episodes kind of switching gears. And again, this one was a really great one. I re-listened to it um, as I was prepping for this episode. And I thought, man, this was a really good episode. So hopefully we'll have this guest on again. I've reached out to him, but I'm sure he's a little bit more popular now than when he was back then. Episode 24 it was all the way back in season three. It was Dr. Alan Thompson uh, with the future of AI. This was all the way back in March of 2022. And him and I had met through Potapalooza. This was kind of early days of AI and there was a lot of stuff going on talking about it. And so it, it's a really great episode. And he really talks about why AI AI took such huge jumps during the pandemic. The next Potapalooza is coming up actually November 2024. Hopefully it's going to work into my schedule and I'll be able to join. But we do have an affiliate link below. So if you'd like to learn more about Potapalooza and you'd like to either be a guest on other people's podcasts or maybe be a host and get a lot of new great guests, um, terrific event run by Kimberly Crow and the team. Yeah, I think that did have something to do with it. It was around the pandemic when the big AI scientists were locked down in San Francisco and did release the big major model that was called GPT-3 and it's currently typing as we speak it's typing 3.1 million words per minute it's being integrated into IBM and Disney Duolingo using it as their translation uh, technology it's writing books it's designing the artwork and uh, the text in the in this comic book thank you for putting that in the show notes thanks to my <laughs> green screen and it's taken the entire corpus of, of authors like Douglas Copeland, you might remember him as the author of, of Microsurfs and Generation X. He's done some great stuff. It took his 1.3 million words from his several dozen books, and it's writing new stuff based on what he's already put into writing. So the fact that it's augmenting so many industries, professions, fields already, careers already, is not frightening, not concerning. For me, it's exciting that this is available, that it's doing so many things in so many different fields and so quickly. One other thing I wanted to talk about is, you know, I kind of mentioned how Juan's helping us with the SEO improvements and now bringing in the shorts. And, you know, again, some of these things do take time and energy. And it wasn't just something that I had skills to do. And I was doing 15 other things, as always, writing books, speaking on stages. And so I'm just super thankful that Juan has come in and helped create the shorts. 
And two shorts in particular have done incredibly well. Again, we'll drop these probably in the newsletter. So those and maybe resurface them again so people can um, listen. But from Isis Fabian's um, episode, and she talks about millennials and Gen Z at work. Obviously, this is kind of a hot topic of, you know, what it's like working with this newer generation coming in um, and how even, you know, these two siblings are quite different from each other and their views. Um, and so ISIS is an incredible expert um, in this. And uh, that video has 2.6 thousand views already and continuing to grow every week. You're saying with the kind of the generational shifts happening in the workplace. Well, I think for one, we're already seeing millennials moving in on the tail end of Gen X to take over some of those boomer positions, right? Because Gen X is a much smaller generation compared to millennials and compared to boomers. And so we're seeing millennials. You are very talented. If you have that ambition and that drive as a millennial, you don't really hear the story of like, oh, I can't advance, oh, I'm stuck, you know, and stagnant. It's like, the opportunity is there if you want it. More often you hear the opposite, which is like, oh my God, so much being thrown at me at once. I'm not ready for this promotion. Like, I hear that from millennials a lot, right? But millennials do have this attitude that's creating a gateway for Gen Z, who, to, to take a step back, is coming in with a totally different worldview. In a very close second place is my good friend, Dean Fisher, and he does amazing work. But one of the things that we got in that episode was a lot of vulnerability. And I love this with Dean. He's just a very kind person. And we talked about um, embracing discomfort and how that helps our growth. So that short's got 1,300 views, roughly, and again, continuing to grow because I think, again, it resonates with a lot of people, that vulnerability that we can share together um, as we embark on new careers and, and changes in our life. When you become comfortable with being uncomfortable, that's when the magic of life happens. But in the end, it, it, it was obvious to me when it was time to make decisions because I got so uncomfortable doing what I was doing. So these are all signs as you're going through your life that when things start to feel a certain way, it's saying to you, time to move on, time to find a new opportunity, time to embrace that part of you that makes you feel uncomfortable because here's the truth everyone when you become comfortable with being uncomfortable that's when the magic of life happens those are some of my top ones as far as like you know kind of the usual stats um, but behind the story there's always great stories um, so don't leave it just to the stats as to why it might be a great episode and just a few more things i wanted to think about and share as i was reflecting on the episode is also, one of the strangest things that have happened while I was recording, one of the funniest ones is while I was recording with Jeff Klein, um, and I don't know, and this was, again, I think one that came out of Potapalooza. I don't know if we cut it in the editing, but his cat walked across the screen. So if you're watching the video version, you're going to see his cat there for a while blocking the video. Um, I'm surprised that didn't happen to me on any number of occasions, um, but I generally learned to lock the cat out of the office after a few incidences where he sat on my keyboard or pushed the mute button or any number of things or just started crying because he wanted to be on the podcast and not me. <laughs> Another technical issue is I was interviewing with Ana Maria. That one wasn't too long ago and her internet went down um, there in Colombia. And we ended up having to just kind of go back and record a whole second episode. We just put back on the same clothes. So you guys may not have noticed it, but we've actually pieced together two different episodes. And the team did a great job of making that look seamless. Again, the beauty of video is uh, you can fix it. And uh, even when kind of crazy stuff happens. And then the last one was when we were launching the Great Leadership Awakening. And I had this great plan that I was going to try to do a bunch of podcast interviews with the different women that were in that anthology book while we were all together launching the book in Beverly Hills. And nothing went according to plan, not in that one. And that one was weather related. We were supposed to be outside in this beautiful venue on the beach, and then it was uh, forecasted to rain. So we moved it inside to a new hotel in Beverly Hills. Um, and so I ended up recording with the rain pouring down. We still got some great episodes. <laughs> But it wasn't my normal podcast studio, so definitely a few hiccups. And all I could think in my head was it, that song, It Never Rains in Southern California, as it poured, absolutely poured rain all weekend long. <laughs> that was also the trip where I spent more time in the airport than I actually did in L.A. I was only in L.A. for like 36 hours for that trip. And on the way home, luckily on the way home, my flight back to Chicago got canceled. 
I had left LA and I was stopping just briefly in Vegas to change planes. And for some reason in that very short (laughs) flight, my second flight got canceled. And so I got there and I said, okay, what's going on? And she's like, "Um, well, we've rescheduled you to Tuesday. It was Sunday, kids. (laughs) So I ended up having to spend an hour in the airport just trying to figure out how to get my flight rescheduled, what was even available. Um, They managed to still get my luggage, but not to Chicago. They sent it to Phoenix. (laughs) And then I had to go. Oh, I I ended up going to Nashville. And then they ended up sending me to Midway when my car was actually at O'Hare. So um, I don't think I ended up getting home. I left L.A. at like five in the morning and I didn't get home to Chicago till like after midnight. So that was a rough return uh, on top of all the other chaos of the rain. Celebrating not just my podcast is that this adventure has really allowed me to be on so many other cool podcasts as a guest. And one of the most unexpected adventures for me was as I was getting ready to launch Chameleon Mindset last year, I had all these grand plans. You know, I need to get on more stages. I need to get on more podcasts. I've got to promote this book and my new coaching. And so a friend of mine, um, Michael Bozinski, Buzz, um, was going to an event with Pantheon FM in Salt Lake City, and someone got sick. And he said, hey, can you go to Salt Lake City this weekend? There's this cool podcasting event. Um, you're going to you know, swap podcasts with all these high level people that have other shows and it's a, a mastermind. And I said, that sounds exactly up my alley. I can get 12 podcasts done in two days with people I haven't met before and get the mastermind out of it. So I hopped on a plane, went to Salt Lake City and uh, we karaoke the night by once we finished with all the podcasts. The even funnier part about that story is You know, that part was unexpected. But what I was doing the following week is I was going to PodFest in Orlando, again, promoting my book um, and obviously the podcast as a part of that event. They had a whole author fair section that was happening because a lot of podcasters have books these days. And it ended up almost uh, like probably 50 to 60 percent of the people that were at the Pantheon event in Salt Lake City were also going to PodFest. You know, kind of makes sense. It's one of the biggest podcast events here in the country. And so um, funny enough that we all ended up in Orlando. And so I got to spend more time with some really great people, um, get to know them a little bit better and, uh, you know, connect and expand our networks uh, just really two weeks apart. Um, So that was really great. Um, And speaking of PodFest, um, they are about to get ready and ripping up their pod tour that's going all around the country as they end up again in January back at PodFest in Orlando. Um, I believe they're coming here to Chicago, so we're working on that. So stay tuned for more details, but definitely check out the PodFest website if you are looking to connect with other podcasters. There are so many ways in person and virtually to connect with podcasters. Um, I actually went to Pod Tour not here in Chicago. <laughs> Another kind of funny, crazy story of how my life goes and how I get into these things. I was, again, uh, in Dallas at that event where I had met Abby, and I uh, was going to Austin to go hang out with some other friends before I came home. And so I drove to Austin, and I realized they were having their pod tour there. I had missed the one in Chicago because I was already traveling. And so I was like, well, who cares? I'm just trying to meet podcasters. It doesn't really matter where they are. So I ended up going to the uh, um, August pod tour. Chris Krimistos was there um, along with uh, the guys from Red Hat and other places. So um, it was it was just great. I met some incredible people, some great podcasters. And again, then I got to see them in real life again uh, when I went to PodFest that January. So definitely check out pod tour um, as a part of PodFest. Go to PodFest if you can. Uh, lots of great people there and uh, a chance to podcast literally right on the spot with some really cool people. Alrighty, we went a little bit over, but it's a celebration. So I wanted to fit a lot in to really recap um, all the great memories that I've had over the last few seasons. Hard to believe that I started this podcast all the way back um, at the beginning of 2021. And it's now 2024 and we are still going. So I'm excited for what's to come. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see how many more episodes we do. Or maybe we'll make a new podcast and come up with a new topic. Um, you guys probably heard uh, at the beginning of the season eight, um, I talked a little bit about there's going to be some changes to my coaching programs. And I'm going to be integrating fitness more into the mindset work that I do. 
um, really helping entrepreneurs get out of their seats and continue to keep themselves and their brain happy so that we can continue to work and have lots of energy, not just for our business, but for all those fun things we do in the rest of our life. So, all right, guys, it is time to sign off. I am so excited for you guys to hopefully listen, not just to episode 100, but to go back to previous episodes. Let me know which ones you guys have liked. Maybe we'll see if we can get them back on the show. And if you'd like to be a guest, um, definitely reach out, grab us on the website at thenikkigreen.com forward slash podcast. And uh, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe, help us get our numbers up so more people can reach us. Uh, like, follow, comment, whatever it works and looks like on that platform where you like to go. Um, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We don't have Google Podcasts anymore. Let's see, what is that? Uh, We've got uh, Amazon Music and of course YouTube to catch the video. Okay, guys, well, it's been fun. It's been real. You can catch us for episode 101 and more where all the cool kids hang out that do podcasts. Bye, everybody.